All right, all right, all right. Welcome back to the Misfit Nation. If you have not had the chance, check out our first book, 13 Step Guides to Success. It is available in paperback and Kindle editions through Amazon. If you're listening or watching for the first time, thanks for joining us. And be sure to subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast apps. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Underscore Misfit Nation. That's The Underscore Misfit Nation. So you'll stay up on all our episodes as they release, while also having the opportunity of getting to hear stories of our amazing guests. Speaking of which, our next guest is the debut author of Sunflowers Beneath the Snow, a historical fiction set in Ukraine. This story is ripped from the headlines and will help readers understand the current Ukrainian conflict and develop empathy and compassion towards their plight. Uh, our author comes to us from a family of military veterans and is a world traveler thanks to her time as a military child or military brat, as we like to call them. So without further ado, let's welcome to the Misfit Nation, Miss Terry Brown. How are you, Terry? Yeah, I'm doing great, Rich. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm glad we we're able to connect. Uh, like I told you during our, our pre-interview stuff, that this is something that, that's passionate for all of us right now. Uh, with the, the plight of the people of Ukraine right now and their tenacity and their fight and their courage, what they're doing right now against uh, what was supposed to be a much superior force is it's mesmerizing to especially veterans to watch it happen. It, it brings a, brings chills on our, in our back of our necks and stuff and makes us happy to see the little guy win. So it's pretty awesome. Yeah. I've seen quite a few things that just, that make me smile from one end to the other. Like the, the one woman that told the <laughs> Russian soldier to put the sunflower seeds in his pocket. Yes. That way when he died, they would grow. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, Oh my gosh, can you imagine having the guts to do that? But what I've also noticed is the guts of like Russian citizens who don't like what's happening, who are going out and, you know, they're, they, there's a picture of a, a grandma riding on the subway dressed in a, a bright blue coat and a yellow scarf. And, you know, she's not saying anything, but there she is riding in the subway right through, you know, her big town in Russia. And you see things like that and you realize that this, what's going on, although it is a Russian-Ukrainian thing, it's a government thing, you know, and there are a lot of people who are involved who'd rather not be, so. Right, it's definitely a geopolitical kind of a power grab for those in power in Russia. Even their soldiers didn't know what was going on. Most of them no. who, who have either been captured or surrendered are saying they, they thought they were going to take the Nazis out of Ukraine, which is way beyond the truth, so. So it's crazy, the news that you're getting out of this. And it's like watching it live now. Past wars, you weren't able to really watch things as they unfold like we are now. But with social media and everyone having the ability to connect, you can see as it happens. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's probably one of the best things that's happening for Ukraine right now is that people can see what's happening in real time. And even though some of the news they tried to kind of stifle in the beginning it's getting out because there are ways to get it out now and and we're seeing what the truth is and it's it is it's great to see i have to i, I woke up the morning that the that it happened you know that they actually went in and invaded and i was just devastated and i had to kind of i mean we all are but i felt like overly so and it's because i spent two years writing a book and really getting into Ukraine and, you know, the characters are, you know, fictitious. I have one character that's based loosely off of someone I know, but they're, they're fictitious, but still they're, they're based very much on real people and how real people are living in Ukraine. And so, yeah, my heart was broken. I really felt brokenhearted about the, about everything. And so when I see these stories of the people standing strong and you know refusing to leave and and standing up to the bullies i love it it is yeah it makes me happy so i put that all over my social media <laughs> yeah. the first night of it i just got finished with an interview talking to a, a russia ex or china expert actually and he asked me about ukraine so he wanted to talk about that a little bit and we discussed what we thought might happen and then as soon as uh -huh. i got up as soon as I got off the interview is when it started. So that was like 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night. And I stayed up till 3 in the morning watching it and then went to work the next morning to do all my analyst stuff on it. And it it was really in real time. Analytics is a lot different than I, I thought it would be because I hadn't done it before. 
So to analyze as it happens was amazing. And to see the swell of, of emotions for the Ukraine people and their pride and patriotism was outstanding. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So Terry, if you don't mind, uh, tell the audience a little bit more about yourself than I did. And uh, from as far back as you want to go to how you got into wanting to be a writer to where we are now. All right. So um, as you said, I'm an Air Force brat. Um, My dad was in Greece uh, when I was born. And um, eventually we moved to Ohio. And that's kind of where I I did a majority of my growing up. And then we moved to North Carolina when I was 15. Um, As a little, little child, little girl, I used to say that I wanted to be a brain surgeon and an Olympic ice skater and an author. Well, I've made one of three, so I feel like I'm doing pretty good. Most kids don't usually pick one of three, so I think that, you know, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good thing. Um, in 2000, right around 2000, I started writing for small businesses, doing a lot of um, articles and website material and ebooks and, you know, just whatever they kind of needed in written material. But I really, really wanted to do my own writing, my own fiction writing, but there was just that part of me that was afraid to try it because, you know, if someone didn't, you know, if I was writing for a real estate agent and I wrote an article and someone didn't like that article, I didn't worry about it because it just meant that they really weren't into, you know, real estate investing or whatever I wrote about. But if someone doesn't like your character that you created or this story that you've put out that's a little more personal that's kind of like saying hey I don't like you (laughs) so I was you know I was really kind of afraid to let it get out there but um I met a, a a young lady much younger than me who had a a newborn and she was trying to write her first novel and she told me about this really great writer's retreat and, oh, I should give it a try. And I don't know what possessed me, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to do that. And I went on this writer's retreat and I wrote 50,000 words in a week. Wow. And I just kind of like, it just like fell out of me. And I tell people that that's my first novel. It's never going anywhere. It's not that good. But it proved to me that I had it in me. And then I had that ability to have a story that, that, you know, it had a beginning and a middle and an end. And it, you know, it did all the things a story was supposed to do. And then all I needed to do was work on the craft and get a little better at what it was I was trying to do. And so I wrote another and then I wrote another and then I wrote another. And this is the one, Sunflowers Beneath the Snow, is the one that I finally really put out there to, um, to publishers to see you know, who might take an interest. And it got picked up and it went out in January and it kind of looks like I started the war, but you know. (laughs) (laughs) This, the war actually started in 2014. You can't take all full credit. Yes, that is true. That is true. (laughs) But it was very quiet for a long time, I think. Right. (laughs) Well, I mean, you, but, you, know, you wrote uh, a story yeah, so based I, on it. So, I mean, you can take some of it. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. So the, the story that I wrote actually ends in 2016, but the, the bulk of the ending was in 2014 because the character that I told you about um, in the book, her name is Iona. And this is someone that I know that was visiting from Ukraine for a summer because she was um, doing a camp counselor program where they come in for the summer, they get to work at the camp, and then they get about another month on their visa where they can go travel around the United States, and then they go home. Well, she had done that in the summer of 2013 and came back again for the summer of 2014. And when she went to go home in August, she couldn't because her parents lived in Crimea, and she was unable to go home. So she stayed another three months. Uh, They were able to extend her work visa. Um, She was working with a lawyer and the lawyer was telling her, we're not going to get this done fast enough. You're not going to be able to stay. And I'm going to get you to maybe Poland or to another refugee camp. And this, this friend was a friend of my, my girls. And she just decided that she didn't want to do that, that she didn't want to be in a refugee camp somewhere other than home. So she disappeared. And she disappeared into New York City and went into the Brighton Beach area and just kind of 
slid away, but kept working with her lawyer and eventually did get the everything got worked out. She was allowed to stay. And so she stayed Well, she came back to see us in 2016. And she told me this story, this little sliver of a story. And I thought, there's no way that cannot be true. I must be misunderstanding because, you know, she has a very thick accent and I'm thinking I'm just this is a communication problem so I rearranged it a little I asked her again no that's what it kept coming back to so then I started the you mean to tell me <laughs> and, I, and everything was yes that's true that story was so incredible to me that I created an entire novel so that I could tell that ending and that little ending, what's really interesting is uh, I have a Kirkus review, and the Kirkus review said, there's a great deal of improbability in that portion of the tale, meaning the ending. And what's funny is, is it's the only portion of the tale that's true. Wow. <laughs> it's so fake. It can't happen. And, that's yeah, why I... and you know, the, the, it is true that often truth is crazier than than fiction and in this case it really is and i can't tell you what it is because then it would ruin the whole story so you know by all means run right out there and buy it but um <laughs> but it was like i said this little teeny sliver of a story of hers and then i just created eighty thousand words around that so that i could tell that story that's outstanding and that's a great way to have uh, actual uh, data to go with as you wrote your story, just based on yeah. using that ending to cir circle that with your thousands of words and get that thing out there. Yeah, and you know, I always knew where I was headed. I didn't quite know how it was going to get there, but I always knew what the ending was. So you just kind of, I was able to let the story flow very naturally. And when something would come up, as long as I could wind that back to that, that ending I knew I was going for, it was, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. <laughs> Kind of like planes, trains, and automobiles. Uh, when yeah. John Candy is on the train trying to get someplace, but he has to take all these different avenues to get there. But he got there, and you were he able got to do there the in same the end, thing. Yeah, you were able to yeah. do that through your creativity and imagination, along with true stories, to get this book. Right, out and there. then and then because I had it set in Ukraine, which it absolutely had to be for this story. But because I had it set in Ukraine, then I was able to also weave in a lot of really good historical information about both Ukraine when they were still under communist rule. The story starts in 1973 and goes through, like I said, to about 2016. And so we see communist rule, we see early independence, we see later independence, and then we also see um, when Russia invades in 2014. So you get a, it's not a history book, but it does give a really good overview and gives people, I think it may be more of an understanding about the relationship between those two countries over a period of time. Definitely. And you said you used a lot of historical references. Uh, did you just go like deep dive on Google or did you go to libraries, encyclopedias and such to try to find as all, much all as you of can? That, on it? You know, I love researching. That's one of the my favorite parts about uh, the job that I was doing when I would work for small businesses is I didn't mind what the, the topic was because that meant I could go in and learn. And so I would go in and you know do all kinds of research. So I did the same thing for this. And, and, you know, you start out with little small pieces, you know, just kind of an overall understanding. And then when you're writing the story and you realize, oh, wait, we're right now in 1989. Well, what would have been going on? And then you look up 1989 and you'd get in there and then you find out, oh, wait, this person said this thing. Ooh, I can fit that in. And then you, you know, so you know, like I found out which winters were the, the coldest winters, and I made sure to use those in the story so that I could have a really cold, miserable winter and those kinds of things. So um, it it's very authentic in that way, where I tried really hard not, I didn't make up places, and I didn't make up uh, political truths, you know, like if if there was an election, I had an election. Um, the The characters, of course, are not real, but the situations that they were in would be real to someone who had lived in that time in Ukraine. And it's also, it's always great to have that authenticity when you're, when you're writing and kind of actually connects you more to the audience, to the person that's reading the book. They don't want to, I mean, there's some people that like to read the far fantasy books and stuff that right, has right. no, no delve into reality, except maybe the first minute or so of the book where they say, 
Johnny went to sleep and started dreaming. The next thing you know, it's the end of the book and he's coming out of his dream. And you have no idea really what just happened in the middle. But there's a, an authentic book like this is much better because it connects more with your audience. And that's one of the things that I'm really, you know, I hate what's going on in Ukraine. It just, oh, it just, it really does tear me up. And I've been a little concerned and had a couple of people say to me, you know, maybe you shouldn't be trying to market this book right now because of what's going on. And I, I kind of took a step back and thought about that and decided that, no, I really need to market this book right now because I think it's going to help people develop a better understanding about what's going on, as well as develop an empathy for the Ukrainian people that they might not have otherwise, because it's kind of like in any situation, if you don't know something about a group and you've heard stories, then you just believe what you hear. But if you get to know someone from that group, then you kind of have something to weigh all that information that you're getting against. And I definitely feel like, you know, when you're done with this book, you feel like, you know, several Ukrainian people and you, feel like you know Ukrainian people kind of as a whole and this compassion and this empathy that's the kind of thing that we need to you know keep all this hate and war from happening um you know I just I just hate I I think that no matter what side of politics you fall on you can say that a sovereign nation should remain sovereign and the idea that there are these bully governments that can just you know come right in and, and railroad right over top of people and start not even just bombing political and, and military targets, but civilian hospitals. And I saw today, I don't know, you know, you never know how much is true, but I saw today where it looks like there was a bombing on a children's and maternity hospital. Yeah. Well, it just sickens me, you know, that sickens me. And I just, I just feel like literature may be, you know, one way to help fight the stupidity that's out there in the world <laughs> to kind of kind of write the balance of uh, what's going on out there and uh, yeah and like yeah. you said there, there's some atrocities going on in that conflict like in all in all waters collateral collateral damage but in this instance the, they are purposely aiming at apartment buildings they're aiming at places that would be able to take care of people and they're doing that on purpose to try to break the heart and soul of the people and exactly in the exactly and that's the point because yeah. they're not they weren't able to come right in and you know railroad right over them and so now they're trying to break them and you know i guess you do that by bombing a maternity ward but i just i think that it's going to probably have just the opposite effect and it's making regular people like me really ticked off <laughs> make you want to get up in arms and go over there <laughs> yeah yeah i was reading i was reading today while i was waiting for a car to get fixed uh, about a, a grandfather from scotland who said he had nothing else to do so he wanted to go fight putin's people so he went over there to fight <laughs> isn't that amazing <laughs> had nothing it's to just do just <laughs> amazing well and the number the number of people ukrainian citizens who aren't in the military, who are taking up arms and who are doing what they can. I mean, it just shows the kind of spirit that they have. You know, they they want freedom. They want to keep Definitely. their freedom. And yeah, I'm I'm very impressed. And so many of their rich and famous are they stayed put to fight. And yes. I mean, that, that's a testament right there. Yes, okay. I agree. Now, if if this conflict didn't occur, would you have uh, gone over there and did a uh, kind of a release of the book there as well? I thought about it. I had also thought about just kind of maybe starting out by heading up to New York City and, and you know, like putting it out among Brighton Beach. Right now with the conflict the way it is, I, I think that would be crazy for me to try to get in the middle of, of all yeah. of that. So I might have to wait until things cool a little bit back off just a little yeah and there's no way i could go to ukraine i mean that would be crazy crazy and i'm i'm i may be nuts but i'm not crazy so well, well there's crazy then like you said there's crazy crazy so you, there's crazy crazy yeah yeah you don't want to yeah. you don't want to go full crazy on this one no unless, no unless i've got, really I've got kids and grandkids they want me around <laughs> yeah definitely grandkids probably watch around Grand, grandmas are always loved and they want them yeah. to be spoiled and then sent home high on sugar so that's the best way to do I, it 
let me tell you, being a grandma is the best <laughs> thing ever. I loved being a mom. Being right. a grandma trumps being a, a, a mom by 10 times or more. It, it's just, it's amazing. Like, like you said, you get to do all the things that you love and none of the stuff that you hate. And then when you're tired, you send them all home. <laughs> <laughs> when, when they're all amped up you send them home there you go have a good day it's like bye i love you <laughs> i do i do that with my grand dogs i only have i have three grand dogs right now so that's what i do when i watch them i, I get them all pumped up and send them home <laughs> send them home i'm sure they love you for that <laughs> you know, they go nuts when they're here <laughs> so when you started writing how long how long each day did you spend writing the book so i'm not you know, I don't know how other writers do it. And I always worry that I'm not doing it right. And then I've, I'm learning now to just kind of give up on that, that I don't think there is a right way. I think there's, there's a, my way works for me. I tend to write in fits. Like I might not write for two weeks right. because I just, it's not there. And then I might get like maybe three days where it's obvious I don't have anything else really going on and I'll settle in and I'll write solid for three days and nobody will see me because all I'm doing is writing and I might push out 20, 25,000 words. Wow. <laughs> because it's like it's been percolating in there for however long. Um, I do the same thing really with my business writing too. And I've told a lot of my clients that I really hate to work by the hour because I don't know how to charge them because I might be washing the dishes and thinking about their <laughs> article and do I really charge them for washing the dishes but it means that when I sit down to write the article I write it very quickly because I've been thinking about it for 48 hours and then when I sit down to write I already know where I'm going and I get the whole thing done in 45 minutes but that doesn't mean that it took 45 minutes so I think I do the same thing with my fiction writing is, is, you know, I'm just, it's kind of like percolating and I'm thinking and maybe I'll jot a little note down or something, but I'm not actually writing. And then when I sit down to write, it just kind of all comes together and off I go. So I really love getting to go to like a, a writers in residence type program where I get a week or two completely just me and writing where I don't have the dog to take out and I don't have the husband to feed and I don't have the laundry to do and I don't have my phone ringing and I don't have any of those things because I get into this zone and I just write and write and write and write and write. I see on your website, you have a second novel coming soon. Yes, uh, you want to yes. speak about that at all? Sure. Yeah, it's called An Enemy Like Me and it's set in World War II. Um, but it's that's just a backdrop for the story. And it's really, really loosely based. My grandfather is was he fought in World War II and we're of German descent. My maiden name was Buffmeyer. Uh, and when we came here from Germany, it was Buffenmeyer. So, I mean, it was very German. Um, and in the story, I have the soldier fighting in Germany as an American, but that he's a first generation American. And what I'm exploring is that feeling of the idea that that governments are the ones that kind of set up the wars and regular people are fighting them. And that the person that you're shooting is often very much like you are and that in, in any other situation, you might be having dinner with them. And that it it really struck. And the reason that I, I came up with this idea was a story my grandfather told, because even though we were probably five or six generations in at this point, when he was fighting in Germany, he went through an area that he knew his ancestors had lived. And he said he was constantly thinking, could any of these people be my cousins? Huh. Yeah. And that in any other situation, if he had come to Germany as a, as a tourist, he would have stopped in that town and tried to find his cousins. And instead, he was armed and would have shot anyone who, of course, was planning to shoot him because that's what you do in a war. And he would talk about that, that angst. And so I kind of took 
some of his stories and used it as a way of exploring that whole idea of, of the other thing is, is that he lived in Canton, Ohio, North Canton. And North Canton, when he was born, um, was New Berlin. And they changed the name to North Canton because of, you know, German, you know, anti-German sentiment during World War I. And so it got changed. And then, you know, he's fighting in World War II and he's in Germany. So I kind of use that whole idea of just the idea that we, we come to hate people and really we need to be careful. In fact, we need to be careful when we talk about, you know, like Russians, do we really hate the Russians or do we hate what the Russian government is doing? Right. You know, you have to kind of, I think that language really is important in situations like this because I don't think we hate Russians because there are a lot of Russian people who seem to be very unhappy with what's going on. Right. Just uh, they're afraid and you have to, to be that. careful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have to be careful. You know, so I, that's that's kind of what that one explores is this idea of, you know, that that angst of the war and the the fact that, you know, ordinary people fight the war that governments have started exactly and you know and how that affects not only them but I, I show this from the side of the soldier as well as his wife and his four-year-old mm. son so it sounds in very interesting and in a, a another historical <laughs> novel basically because it's from a history a time in history right. where where things were a little simpler and uh, everyone around the world was in the, in the same fight basically at that time. Yeah. You, you, yeah. You, really, you really couldn't choose sides. Your shot sides were chosen for you. You had to do what you had they to do. They were very much yeah. so. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. That sounds like a very interesting novel as well. Hopefully that one kicks off and goes well, and hopefully nothing crazy happens when that one comes out. Yeah, seriously. Because <laughs> <laughs> if so, I'll stop. <laughs> if so, right about making a million dollars. I don't know. <laughs> That might be the one thing you want to do at that point. <laughs> and get the trust fund going for the grandchildren. That's true. That's true. Those grandkids would like that, wouldn't they? <laughs> yes, they would. They, they'd probably say, Grandma, let's write a children's book now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if you had to give advice to an aspiring writer, what would that be? I think the biggest thing, well, two things. Number one, write. Just do it. Write. Even if you aren't planning to show it to anyone yet, Right, because you don't get better at writing by thinking about it, and you don't get better at writing even by taking classes. You get better at writing by writing. So the more you write, the better you're going to be. So get started right away. You know, like just start writing. And then the second thing is, is don't be as afraid as I was. Like just go ahead and and put it out there, because the worst that's going to happen is someone's not going to like it. And if someone doesn't like it and you can ask them and, and listen with, with, you know, honest and open ears, if you listen to why they don't like it, you will learn how to make your writing better. Right. And it's worth it. It's worth it. So you put it out there and they say, well, you know, that's not bad, but, you know, don't get yourself all riled up and, and stop listening. Listen very carefully. And the next time you write, try that see how that goes for you. And then the third thing that I would say is, is don't listen to everyone's advice. Go ahead and try something. But if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you. Move on. Not, not everybody's going to love your work. Not everybody's going to love your writing style. And not everybody's advice is going to work for you. So you just have to be open to, to listen to that advice and then know yourself well enough to know what's really not working for you. And move on from that. That's all good advice right there. I like that. <laughs> the listen to hear advice is very important in everything we do in life, not just in, in our careers or creativity. Because a lot of people, they'll give you advice that have never done anything. And they usually see you do something. Oh, I would have done it this way. Oh, okay. Then why didn't you do it? And But you say, all right, thank you. And just move on. And that's, what, that's a lot of the stuff you get. And like you said, when you get a ton of advice like that, you can't keep changing what you're doing based on a ton of advice maybe tits, tits and tats it is, tidbits it is, and that'll help you out. And I think what you, you're you doing in that advice will help all the aspiring writers out there. Thank you so much. And finally, how does someone get in contact with you if they want to either just have you on their show or, or just chat with you? 
Yeah. Well, the, the easiest way I think to tell people on a podcast is to go to my website. Um, and it's www.terrymbrown.com. That's Terry with one R and M like Mary. Um, and on that page, there's a contact page. There's all of my social media. Uh, you can join up for my newsletter. In fact, if you join on my newsletter right now, you can get the first chapter of my next book. And so go ahead and start previewing that, see what that's like. Um, and by all means, go to Amazon, purchase my book. You'll love it. <laughs> Review it on Amazon. I'll love you. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. Is it on anywhere else besides Amazon or just Amazon right now? Um, it's on Amazon. You can get it actually at my website. I know it's on Barnes and Noble. I've seen it on Abe books and new books and i think it's on several places okay yeah. awesome i'm not i'm not exactly sure where all my publisher has put it but pretty much if a book is sold you should be able to get it there so look look for it sunflowers beneath the snow awesome thank you terry for taking taking some of your time to tell us about your book and uh, to discuss ukraine with us here today and uh, uh, wish you nothing but success in the future thank you so much for having me